This is Town Square Sunday on 1420 WBSM, the place where people come together to talk about the good things happening in and around New Bedford. Come together right now. Oh. And now, the moderator of Town Square Sunday, Jim Phillips. Well, good morning and welcome to our weekly public affairs program, Town Square Sunday. I'm Jim Phillips. And this week, we lead off with a discussion about the New Bedford Highway killings, a 30-year-old crime now that sadly has yet to be solved. Former Standard Times reporter Maureen Boyle had written a book on the case, Shallow Graves, and I think it's raised great interest about the case all over again. Next year, filmmaker Aaron Kaju of Bristol County Media is scheduled to release a five-part documentary about the killings and subsequent investigation. Uh, Is it right to call it a documentary, Aaron, or or is this a true crime film, perhaps? True crime documentary series, I I guess, is the best way to put it, similar to, you know, Making a Murderer, The Jinx, or, you know, any of these these true crime series that are out there now. So Aaron is uh, joining us today here, obviously, to talk about the film entitled The New Bedford, rather, The Highway Murders. That's correct. The Highway Murders. So welcome, Aaron. Thank you very much for having me. All right. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, Aaron, why focus on this crime? You know, there's a lot of crime. This is, I, I assume it's because it's happened in your backyard. You're a South Coast resident, and it's happened here, and um, obviously it's, there's still great interest. Well, as a filmmaker, it's always good to pick a topic that's both has a, a large interest um, this was a, nas- a nationally covered case at the time. There's still uh, very much an interest in this case locally and even on a national scale. True crime is, is, a, is a hot topic right now. So it was locally accessible. We didn't have to travel to do this. And the story is very, very interesting. So it had a good recipe for being a topic that we would like to cover. When did you start this project? About four years ago. We kind of, I was coming off the Bridgewater Triangle documentary, and the big question is, what's next? And uh, one of the guys we interviewed in the film, former Freetown detective Alan Alves, actually, we were talking, he's like, what are you, you going to do with this deep voice? What are you going to do next? And I said, <laughs> you know, I really don't know. And he says, I have a suggestion. And he said, uh, why don't you do the, the highway murders? And I, of course, knew of the highway murders because I'm a South Coast resident. Hadn't really researched it, but the first thing we did was pick up Carlton Smith's book that came out in the, mid, in the early to mid-90s because at that point Maureen's book hadn't been released yet. And we read that book, and one thing led to another, and we started doing extensive research and decided that this was something that we wanted to tackle. I know you've talked to a lot of people in your work here in the nearly four years of work, or about four years of work you've done. So how many people have you talked with? How many people have gone on camera? How many people have Six. given you just information? Um, on camera, we've interviewed over 60 um, in terms of off-the-record discussions, the number's in the hundreds, yeah. you know. Um, but, yeah, on, on-camera interviews were over 60 at this point. And those folks include survivors of the victims? Yeah, uh, family, f- friends and family of the victims, uh, media personalities such as, such as yourself that yeah. covered the case, uh, retired law enforcement, both state and local police, retired district attorneys. I mean, we've pretty much run the gamut. Um, give us a progress report on the film. Where are you now? At this at this juncture? Well, I guess when we first started, it was intended to be a singular feature-length documentary, but very early on, we came to the, the realization that you can't do this story justice in one single feature-length film. So it became, well, this is going to be maybe a three-part series, and as we pr- progressed with it, it was like, oh, it's going to be a four-part series, and then now we're up to a five-part series. And we are pretty much done with parts one through four at this point. We're just doing the fishing, finishing touches on those, and we're actively working on part five. Each episode runs between 75 to 90 minutes. So it falls in line with what's popular now as being a true crime documentary series. So what's left to be done in terms of this final segment? Is it Have you done all the filming for that or, or no? Part five is pretty much... Um, in, in the early stages now in terms of we, we have a lot of it has to be shot and, and, and it has to be edited. So, you know, we're, we're four-fifths of the way there, I, I would say. All right. Um, and your target date for releasing the film? We don't have a hard date. We're just hoping to finish the series in this, ca- this upcoming calendar year, 2019, and then put it in front of a potential buyer um, who can put it in front of a national audience. That's the goal. So um, when we're talking national audience, are you talking like uh, 
uh, HBO or something else? I th- no, I think that this series is built to be presented either through something like HBO or Netflix. Um, each episode is 75 to 90 minutes. They're not really built to have commercial breaks. So a format like HBO or Netflix where there is no commercial breaks, I think is best what this is best suited for. Or, you know, Amazon. There's, there's a lot of different outlets now, especially with the internet and streaming where um, – you know, you don't have to worry about the advertising. Yeah, they're looking for content. Looking, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. They're all looking for content for sure. And uh, if it uh, this story, putting aside the heartache of the story, but this story itself is, uh, you know, mesmerizing. There are aspects to this case that if you, if somebody were writing a script for a fictional story about a serial killer. And you wrote some of the some of the things that actually happened in the highway murders into a script. People would say you can't put that in there. It's not believable. You know, but these are things that actually happened. You actually had the family of the primary suspect coincidentally living next door to the district attorney. You actually had another suspect who was living in the church rectory with a Catholic priest in Freetown, and the police go there for to, uh, to, with a warrant for his arrest, and he's hiding on the roof of the church rectory. I mean, these are things that actually happened. They're very hard to believe, but they actually happened. And uh, you know, the, the, these. These items that uh, Aaron just mentioned, uh, I can tell you they did all actually happen, and they all have an air of mystery around them, and they all have a, uh, you know, how could this be? But it was. It was. 30 years ago, that was the way uh, it was. Um, So we're looking at a calendar year of uh, 2019. Anything about this film um, that was difficult to do uh, besides, obviously, tracking down people and all of those things after a 30-year-old crime, that that cannot be easy. Well, the tracking down people thing is kind of funny because we live on the South Coast, and as everybody knows, there's a very high Portuguese population. So some of these people with Portuguese last names, you're looking for like a Madeiras or a DeMello or or whatever. It's like, oh, gosh, how do you find these people? And our recipe for success has been a combination of social media, obituaries, and people search. With that recipe, you can pretty much track anybody that's still alive down, and we've been pretty successful with that. Um, but that's been one of the more difficult parts of this is trying to track people down that were associated with this case back then. Um, this case is a hornet's nest. There's a lot of people that still don't want to talk about it. There's a lot of people that shy away from it. Um, so some of the speaking to members of law enforcement has kind of been hit or miss. Some of them have been willing to be interviewed. Other ones want nothing to do with us and cut a wide path around us. So it depends on who, you, who you're asking. Um, but we found that, um, you know, that's, that's kind of hit or miss. Yeah. Anything else that's made it uh, difficult to do? People coming forward is one thing. Anything well, re- the research aspect of this was kind of difficult because you're talking about a case that kind of predated the digital age, um, mm-hmm. and there's not a lot of archival material available online. The Standard Times digital archive only goes back to, like, 1993, and this stuff happened between 88 and 91 primarily. So it involved going back to physically going back to the microfilm and going through day by day from July 3rd of 1988 when the case started right up through 1991 and finding every single article that we could find. And just in the Standard Times alone, it totaled like 400 plus articles about just this case. Um, and then uh, through news news segments, uh, uh, Jim was nice enough to give us access to the, uh, to the old New Bedford Cable News Archive and we had to go through and find tapes and find tape logs and fast forward and rewind and find find the old segments that way too and that that was time consuming sure. and, you know this has been primarily a two person operation you're listening to Town Square Sunday. My guest is uh, filmmaker Aaron Kadju who had some success with a film about the Bridgewater Triangle and is now nearing completion on a film about the highway murders which happened in New Bedford, 88, 89. Um, tell us a little bit about Bridgewater Triangle. Um, you, you, you did a, a film there. Uh, you won some acclaim with that. It was uh, shown around the area. Tell me the uh, success of Bridgewater Triangle. Well, the, we released the Bridgewater Triangle in 2013. Uh, to a sold-out audience at UMass Dartmouth, which which was nice, and we sold we, we showed it maybe you know 50 times locally. After that, a lot of those shows were sellouts, and uh, we were lucky enough to get approached by Discovery Channel a couple months after the film premiered. They were looking for the U.S. broadcast rights, so they picked it up, and for a four-year period, it ran off and on on Destination America, one of the Discovery networks, and it's since uh, we've also since gotten the film on Amazon Prime, where for a Large period of time, if you searched paranormal documentary on Amazon, this came, the Bridgewater Triangle came up number one out of a thousand titles. 
So, I mean, it's a modest success story. I mean, the 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 film kind of raised the profile of the Bridgewater Triangle, and it's now known as, you know, a, a reputable true crime documentary. So, so that's something we're pretty proud of. And if it wasn't for the Bridgewater Triangle, this this project would probably never have happened. Yeah. Um, you are listening, as we mentioned, to a Town Square Sunday. Why go with five parts rather than, uh, you know, that two-hour production we talked about? Now, I know there's a lot of material here. Um why does five parts work? I don't think we we weren't aiming for five. Right. It just kind of happened that way. Um, the, the story's told chronologically. So it starts, you know, in, in July of 88 and works its way up through 91 and into the present day. And so the way that we would put these stories together is we would try to aim for each episode to be somewhere in that 75 to 90 minute mark. And you've got to find a good place that there's a cliffhanger that, that leads into the next episode. And so we had a 90-minute episode edited for part one, which starts in July of, of 88 and then kind of ends at the new year of 1989. So that 90 minutes only covers that amount of ground. But there's so many victims, there's so many suspects, there's so many aspects to this case that you couldn't do the story justice in one film. So we found that taking our time, letting the story breathe, uh, serves the story better and you know, as we're editing it, editing it together chronologically, we were like, okay, well, part two now only took us up to the spring of 89. So part three takes you up to... So it, it was just a matter of, of allowing the story to breathe and not trying to rush it. Aaron, do you hope to solve the crime with this film? You know, of course you would hope that something jostles loose in this case from something like this you know somebody might come forward with information or, or we may uncover something ourselves or whatever of course you, you hope something like that I mean you look at what uh, Jer- the Andrew Jarecki did with with the jinx uh, those filmmakers essentially solved that the, the Robert Durst case right. um, so you know it, it does happen and it can happen and it's something that you know of course we would we would hope that that's a possibility mm-hmm. I mean this is I mean we've talked to Probably nine of the not of the eleven victims of the highway murders, we've had contributions from nine of the families, and they've been universally supportive of what we're doing. And just to talk to these people is absolutely heartbreaking. I mean, they've had thirty years of just no answers to their questions, thirty years of heartache, and that was one of the things we were concerned with early on: is how, what kind of reaction are we going to get from the families of the victims? And as I said, they've been overwhelmingly supportive. So we would like, of course, you want to see those people get some answers to their questions. You mentioned this earlier, but I'd like to get a little deeper into it. What kind of reaction have you had from police? Um, there have been people that we've talked to in law enforcement that are very supportive of what we're doing. And like I said, there are other people that um, have avoided us like we're the plague. So um, whether that's because it's an unsolved case or whether it's it's just it's a, it's a controversial case, they just want to steer clear of it. Some people may retire right off into the sunset and want nothing to do with uh, with their past life and want to push that stuff aside. So I think it's a, a different 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 circumstances for every retired cop or, or investigator. But, um, you know, that's like I said, that's been hit or miss. Yeah. Is there a surprise ending in this film? You're going to tell us who, who the killer is? I mean, we, we would love to be able to do that. Um, we have uncovered some new information along the way with this, um, some surprises in there, things that didn't make it into into the news or print back then. As far as a surprise ending, I think it's it's a little early to say, um, but I would hope that we could, you know, or, or maybe just new information that people didn't know before that might, might be able to help them come to some conclusion in their own minds about this case. It seems... Uh I don't know how much more you you found some new information. You're saying, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, even pertaining to things that happened back then, uh, aspects of the case that weren't necessarily covered in yeah. the press back then. People that have come to us with stories and information that what what can be new? Thirty years we've been wrestling with this case as a region. Uh, what is it that is? Are, are they small items? Are they? Yeah, they, they, a lot of them are like personal stories sure. um, from, you know, some of the best interviews in, in this series are from people that s- were living life on the streets back then, maybe had addiction problems back then, but they've managed to turn their lives around. Mm-hmm. And some of those people have been willing to be interviewed. And some of the stories that they have provided to us, 
you know, they can't absolutely be verified, but we have no reason to believe these people are, are lying to us. Um, some of those stories are, are aspects in, of this case that people haven't heard before. Um, so I think that that's the kind of stuff that um, people will find very interesting. What needs to be done to find this person or persons involved? Uh, what do you think? Well, of course, the big mystery surrounding this case is the, the, the potential existence of DNA evidence. And we haven't gotten a definitive answer one way, the other, uh, one, way of the, uh, one way or the other as to the existence of DNA evidence. Now, when I say DNA evidence, people say, well, they could extract the bone marrow. It's like, no, we know who the victims are. They were identified. The, the big question is, does law enforcement possess what they believe to be the, unidentified, the, the DNA profile of the as-yet-to-be-identified highway killer? We haven't pr- come across any information to suggest that they do, but that's something that they're very hush-hush about. Sure. Um, from my perspective, if law enforcement has come into possession of the DNA of the killer, it would have had to have happened sometime after 2007. Because if they had what they believe to be the DNA of the killer prior to 2007, they never would have bothered digging up Kenny Pont's former driveway in 2007. If they could have said one way or the other that he was absolutely not involved at that point, they never would have gone through the big dog and pony show of digging up his driveway. That never would have happened. So if they came into possession of the DNA of the killer, it would have been sometime in the last 10 years. All right. That's an interesting comment right there. My guest has been filmmaker Aaron Cadu of Bristol County Media. Really good luck with this oh, project. Thank you, and thank you for, for, for helping us along the way. Well, I want to talk about that a little bit here. Broadcast TV stations don't save a lot of footage from 30 years ago. They just don't have the room. Uh, and now that things are digitized, they have a lot more room to save uh, stuff uh, from more modern times, I'll say. Uh, but local cable news in Fall River did. We saved everything. That channel was uh, served New Bedford, Fall River, Dartmouth for many years. Now, I worked there at the time uh, this case broke. We had a gentleman working there named Phil Sabatino, who has since passed on, sadly. But he saved and cataloged everything, every piece of tape. Aaron called me. Then uh, we contacted uh, Renee Kochman and Phil at Fall River Government TV, which at that time had possession of the tapes. And I'm sure he helped you a great deal. He did. And yeah. uh, it's, it's very sad that Phil has since passed on. And it was we were really sad to hear that. And he was so helpful with what we were doing. So after he passed, what ended up having to happen was Fred TV allowed us as the filmmakers to go in with our own laptop and tape, old U-Matic tape deck, huge thing that I borrowed from somebody else. Mm-hmm. And we played the old U-Matic tapes directly into the laptop and had to s- manually search for tapes and logs and, and spent hours alone at Fred TV capturing old stories from these tapes. And uh, it was a lot I, of fun. I, I'm personally I'm glad we're able to help you with this it's because been huge. this story uh, needs to be told and uh, hopefully uh, it can make a difference. Well, it's it's been told in print. But it has never been told in this format before, and it's it's long overdue for a documentary film specifically about this case. Absolutely. Thanks again for coming in, uh, Aaron. My pleasure, and thank you very much for having me. All right. Town Square Sunday returns in just one moment.